Hi, it's Chris Titley here as part of the Bank to the Future 2.0 podcast series. Today's a little bit different. I'm joined by Nathan Led, the head banking analyst at Morgan's. Nathan, thanks so much for being part of this series here at uh, Morgan's HQ. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. So normally we interview some fintechs and we educate the investment community in and around what is happening in, in fintech and, and the big banks. But today is a little bit different. We're trying to talk a bit more macro. We're going to talk a little bit about the banking system and the landscape and the very topical things of what's happening. But uh, before we begin, Nathan, I'd like to get your story about how how you joined Morgan's and, and and your background into where you are now as the lead banking analyst. Yeah, sure, Chris. Uh, I started uh, looking at um, ASX listed infrastructure stocks back in, gosh, 2005. I um, joined Morgan's in, in 2012. But yeah, through that time, I've covered the infrastructure, utilities, transport type stocks, which are, you know, in themselves, you know, steady, stable sort of cash flow generators. So they have the ability to handle a lot of debt. So I needed to get my head around uh, just their debt management, treasury management, et cetera. Before then, I actually spent four and a half, five years over in London working for Royal Bank of Scotland in its heyday when things were all good and, and was actually going okay. And, um, and uh, gosh, it was a fantastic learning experience in terms of looking at um, very large scale energy project financings, infrastructure financings, both uh, in Europe and also in the Middle East. And then uh, before then, before I went across to to to, to London, I um, I spent um, a bit of time in uh, in Brisbane here with Queensland Treasury Corporation, which is a effectively the bond manager for the state government. Mm. Um, so that was the first taste of I suppose debt and, and bonds um, that I, I had in my career. So I suppose I've been lucky enough to look at uh, debt from both a a, uh, a borrower's perspective, mm. and now uh, over time, I've then been handed responsibility for the coverage of the the hybrids that are listed on the um, Australian Stock Exchange, which are mostly bank hybrids. And then um, over the last twelve to eighteen months, also taken up coverage of the of the banks, the major banks that are listed. On Certainly, the a lot of uh, a lot of industry and sector changes over those last eighteen years or so, as you've been in, in, involved in it. And certainly, uh, yeah, recessions and non recessions. So you, you, you've you've seen it all. What in regards to your current role, what what stocks or what companies do you cover now? Yeah, well, I've got the uh, the infrastructure coverage still, but you know, also within the banking space, I've got the coverage of the major banks plus Bank of Queensland, and also looking at some of the uh, the smaller cap banks uh, for, for potential coverage in the future. Yeah, and there's been a certainly a, a roller coaster of um, of uh, I suppose from a macro point of view from the last couple of years. If we take it back to to, to 2020 and the and the lockdowns and COVID and and the Australian consumer was feeling, you know, reasonably uncertain about what was going to go on, and then we saw a, a big uh, I suppose surge of people staying at home and, and and spending money and feeling okay with record low interest rates. We, you know, fast forward that now to when you're covering the banking sector right now, and it's a totally different macro scene. We've seen um, I, I can't remember is it eleven interest rate rises or ten? It's so many that some people can't even remember. Uh, we're seeing you know the the, fix, the fiscal cliff things that we weren't talked about two or three years ago, and a little bit of rockiness uh, from 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 the property market perhaps. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on on what you're seeing. Yeah, you know, as a banking analyst. Um, in regards to what you're seeing at a macro level. Yeah, I mean, right now, I suppose if we could take it back a little while yep. to COVID, I mean, I think that's a really interesting starting point. You know, if, if you remember back at that point when COVID first started coming through, you know, there was real concern that it was just going to flatten the economy. You know, there was going to be 15% unemployment, um, uh, you know, The negative prices. equity was an elephant in the room. It was like, what are the banks going to do in regards Absolutely. to all these people selling these houses underneath the water and yep. so, with no jobs? So yeah. what, what, what happened is that the... Um, you know, the banks basically provision for quite substantial loan losses coming through. And then what did we see from the government? A very big government response, right? Mm. So, you know, from a fiscal perspective, we had all that money getting helicoptered into people's accounts. Um, from an RBA perspective, they cut interest rates down to 10 basis points. They were doing a buying of three-year bonds on the market to try and um, depress the yield curve. And also to support the banks and their lending, they, they put in place this thing called a term funding facility, which gave the banks um, debt at incredibly cheap costs, like between 0.1% and 0.25% for three years. Um, and then what we saw, all of a sudden, the economy wasn't suffering, mm. right? Things were actually going really, really good. So the banks then started to release these provisions that they'd expensed for back into their earnings um, it supported their earnings. Um, and then over time, as the economy was looking like it was really overheating, RBA starts to do these interest yeah. rate increases and absolutely crank them up. So from the bank's perspective, they got 
the benefit, the earnings benefit of these higher interest rates that they could leverage off because they've got low cost deposits, et cetera. So we had a period there, you know, even in the last half, I think it's probably where we really hit the peak, but we've had all time peak earnings for the banks coming through. Right. The outlook is changing though. So that's um that's something we need to look for. Just going back on that facility then, which was very important, which a lot number of people may not realise that happened at the time and was very unprecedented. There's a lot of buzzwords around unprecedented, um, uh, I suppose, systems and, and, and processes that were put into place. I mean, how important was that and how, how did that really set fuel into in terms of lending and getting things going again? You're talking about the term funding yep. facility? Yeah, well, the term funding facility, I suppose, also combined with the 10 basis point cash rate promise from the RBA, as well as that bond buying, really stimulated the economy. And if nothing else, really got the, the housing market really booming. Mm. So, and, and where that really translated through was that the banks took that incredibly cheap funding and then offered up two, three year sort of fixed rate mortgages at ridiculously low prices, yeah. right? We're talking around about sort of 2% here, right? So you've had a like it was, you know, the Australian market is typically a variable rate mortgage market, but the amount of new flow that was fixed rate was enormous. And so that's what we've got coming through now mm. is these two to three year fixed rate loans that are coming through to expiry, an enormous wave of them. And as interest rates have gone up, variable rate loans now are far, far higher. And then on top of that, APRA expects the banks to add another 3% serviceability buffer. On top of that, when they're actually looking at uh, assessing a loan, right? So it's it's quite a major change for those borrowers that were on those fixed rate loans. Yeah, and just on that topic, I mean, that probably would have been peaking twenty twenty, I suppose, in terms of those fixed rates. Um, you know, particularly as the property market started to creep up, you'd see more volume at those fixed rates. So you probably got, you know, twenty twenty three is when they. St- sort of roll off or 2024 when people are talking about the fiscal cliff, something which no one talked about probably two or three years ago because it didn't happen. Um, In regards to your um, thoughts on when it starts, rolls off and the impact, can you talk about that? Look, it's it's a fascinating question. I mean, we had the uh, the CFO of National Australia Bank in just earlier this week uh, in to present into our morning meeting. And his view was that they have access to more data on the economy than any other body in Australia, like even better than Australia. Well, you know, they've got like, you know, 25 to 30% of the uh, small, medium enterprise banking market. They have got a big share of the Australian home lending market. And their view is at the moment, it's quite inconclusive about whether (laughs) Australians are actually feeling the pinch. Um, Certainly they're expecting you, you cannot have this enormous increase in interest rates and not have some sort of effect coming through sooner or later. Um, so it's, it's quite fascinating on this, its front. I mean, to my way of thinking, and maybe I'm looking at the wrong way, but you know, there is a big cohort of existing borrowers that are already on standard variable rate loans. Well, I, I don't know, anecdotally, maybe half, I don't know, or maybe Uh, more or even more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and we'll head up even higher. So they've had the half the population or even more than half the population have, have been, you know, punched the stomach a little bit through this way through and, and adjusted their lifestyle, but the other Part may not have just well, yet. Well, let's not forget that only about a third of Australians actually have a mortgage. Yes. So yeah. it's, and we're talking you know, the mortgage market here, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it is those that have already been on variable rates that have already had quite a significant in- increase coming yep. through. Now, the reports from the banks thus far are those that have seen their fixed rate mortgages convert across into variable rate, their arrears profile is very similar to the existing standard variable rate borrower. Right. So we're just not seeing... The Australian consumer. So at a full at a full restaurant on a Friday, you have got the fixed people having their lunch, and the variable people maybe a few less, but there's still people out there doing spending money and not changing the habits. Which probably you know it comes back to you know the RBA and inflation, etc. Of what's you're trying to curb spending, but if you're on a fixed rate and your property's you know, potentially gone up, you're actually living pretty well at knowing that, yes, down the track, I'll have to kind of yeah. absorb that. But hey, why not? Why not? You know, At the moment, there doesn't seem to have been an impact. So, you know, it, Chris, I think it always comes back to this old, um, you know, economic theory about there's long and variable rate, it's long and variable lags between an interest rate increase yeah. and its impact on the economy. Yeah. And um, it'll be fascinating to see when that plays out. All the major banks at the moment are provisioning for loan losses on their balance sheet based on 
a soft landing. So yep. they're setting their balance sheets up to handle that scenario. Um, uh, you know, so they should be able to get uh, the, through. Just this on that, that word provision, are the provisions equal or somewhat different to where they were in COVID? Uh, yeah, let's have a look. So I think they've actually bolstered them up even higher than when they were before COVID. Yeah, right. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the banks, the, the provisioning requirements underneath accounting stands actually changed back in 2019 before COVID. So it used to be as a, in, as incurred type basis. Now the, uh, the accountants or the accounting stands basically say the banks have to have a forecast of what losses they might make on their loan book underneath different economic scenarios probability weight those scenarios to come up with an expected loss. So the banks are already looking into forecasts of a higher unemployment for bigger property price declines and they've provisioned for those. So we're in a pretty solid state in terms of those scenarios. Now, if we have a hard landing yep. where things get really bad, then the banks are going to have to expense more and that'll hurt their earnings. But at the moment, they look yeah. like they're in an okay spot. So and just recently, we're sort of seeing the inflation figures go – up and down and people are like, oh, is the, the chance of a rate is high, chance of a rate increase is low and we're coming to next Tuesday where there might be another chance of a rate increase and if inflation stays strong, then we're going to get another one and another one, et cetera. Where does it end? What's your thinking around interest rates? And and, and again, those, that, that fiscal cliff will get even worse. The variable people will get even worse and I'm sure from a renter's point of view, that'll probably get even worse as well. Yeah. I mean, it's what you're asking here is the million dollar question about where is interest rates actually going? Um, you know, and gosh, if nothing else, they, the expectations that we're seeing um, implied in the forward curve in the uh, the money markets have been very, very volatile. But, um, mm. you know, uh, I, I can put two scenarios there for yes. you. Yep. So the first scenario is what we're seeing in, in the actual forward curve expectations, which have been for interest rates to kind of stabilize where they are and then towards the end of the year actually start to get tapered away. Um, but then you've got our in-house economist here, Michael Knox, his view is that these interest rates are actually going to head up into the mid 4% type range. Uh, the view there is that, you know, um, yeah, in the US, interest rates are going to have to keep going up to try and bring inflation under control. The rest of the world is going to have to follow. But what will happen is their currency, their foreign exchange rate will actually decline which will mean you're in, you're import more and more of that inflation from the US. So, um, yeah. So his view is that we're actually going to see that continue to head north. So I mean, like you know, there's varying great varying degrees of, oh. of of opinions, and everyone's got one into in to where where it's gone. And now your microscopic view of, of of working within banks and providing recommendations within banks, you must also think about what the bank is is trying to think. What in terms of variation of thoughts is important from a from a bank CFO or CEO's point of view now is you know you've got unemployment, you've got inflation, you've got residential real estate prices. Is there something which sort of stands out for you as one of the key drivers or, or macro drivers that you look at from a from a point of view that may dictate the, the bank's earnings? Absolutely. One hundred percent in terms of, you know, asset quality, um, look at unemployment. Yep. You know, unemployment is the absolute bedrock of of keeping the asset quality of the banks in a really good state so to me unemployment is almost the trigger in terms of probability default so as as unemployment start to rise income generation of households starts to decline that's when they come under stress now banks don't necessarily lose money if uh, households can't actually pay because if their house prices are still high and they come under stress they can sell their house mm. might still be at a loss versus what they paid but remember Banks none of us actually, the, yeah. well, none of us actually um, borrow up to 100%. Yes. It's usually up to 80% with a mortgage insurance. Which is the buffer that the banks, you know, flexibility in terms of liquidation. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yep. you know, they're, they're protected on their asset base. Um, if I'm thinking about earnings and the direction of earnings, then I think probably the two biggest drivers, and let's not forget, 80% of a bank's revenue comes from its net interest income, mm. right? So the Two key drivers there All are the NIM, as people refer to. Yep. Well, yep. NIM times by average interest yep. earning assets, yep. right? So an average interest earning assets is effectively driven by loan growth. So I'm thinking going forwards, RBA has increased interest rates to try and slow the economy, take some heat out of the economy. Part of that will be credit growth declining. So I think we've got to expect that credit growth, which has been very strong, will start to fade down. I'm not saying credit goes backwards, just the growth rate slow. Yep. And then what we've seen, you know, um, CBA alerted to this in their result looking back in October. They said that their net interest margin 
had peaked in October. Now, that was um, a real disappointment to the market because yeah. for over the very long run, net interest margins have been declining because of the intensity of competition in Australia. Yep. But when interest rates went up really quick, the banks got this fantastic sugar hit to their earnings and the market had come to the view that that would cause a very nice earnings or NIM increase um, and also have a bit of longevity to it. Mm. But um, there was a real disappointment with the CBA result where they said, hey, it's peaked earlier than we expected. Yep. Other banks have also said similar things. You know, um, NAB sort of talked about how the intensity of competition really increased in February, March this year for them. Yep. So the the general view is that now there's the, the NIM, the net interest margin, and just as a as a point of context here, Chris, every five basis points on this net interest margin is about five percent on EPS, and the yeah. banks NIMs are around about two percent or two hundred basis points. Okay. So it's yeah, pretty. It's a very meaningful swing yeah, factor. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're likely to be drifting away also. So. Um, you know, I Needless think to say, it's a pretty interesting topic at the moment for, for all parties and the Australian economy and, and governments of the day and the Reserve Bank, et cetera. I just want to touch on that employment, unemployment figure. I mean, what are, what are businesses trying to do in regards to maintain their staff? I mean, the ultimate one is lift wages, right? And, and to say, well, here's a pay rise and we're going well, et cetera, because of the 6 or 7% inflation, we need to keep up with society. Wouldn't you think that you know a, a really good sort of unemployment or a low unemployment rate would sort of fuel inflation to a degree oh absolutely so you know that's um uh, which know, that's, is counterintuitive what we're talking about in trying to cool the economy <laughs> well you know low unemployment means wage growth wage growth the real issue with that is it can actually then drive through into higher inflation the big worry is a permanency of expectations of higher uninflation uh, higher yep. inflation going yep. forwards yep that's the real fear for the rba they want to keep a lid on that if that starts to lift and and work is expected inflation is not going to be two to three percent it's going to be more like four or five yep. they'll start to demand higher and higher wage growth to try and meet that and yep. it's just so hard then to bring that inflation under control yeah. so uh uh yeah it's it's fascinating, fascinating times yeah no i mean this is a, this is a, a, a fintech-ish type pod, um, podcast but it's also got bank to the future i mean um banks are really trying to lift their game when it comes to tech and and innovation, but in and amongst all that is real earnings and real um, drivers of growth and points of growth of which we've covered today, Nathan. So I thank you very much for giving giving us. Just on a personal level, you're a bit of a, a fintech man yourself. Do you use any cool apps yourself or digital banking and tap and pay and things like that? Oh, Chris, I'm a I'm an Apple Pay. And, yep. you know, and like it's fascinating. Each of the banks are really obviously spending enormous amounts of money trying to digitize their operations, trying to remove costs. You know, there's going to be duplication of costs while they do this, but they're trying to replace legacy systems with these new uh, new uh, digital systems. So, yep. And all the things yeah. that go with in terms of personal fin man financial management apps Absolutely. and budgeting. And, and one of them did share trading the other day through the apps. So trying to do different different things. But uh, Nathan, it's been a pleasure to have a chat to a bit about the Australian banking system from a macro point of view and and, and the fin as part of the fintech, the financial services. Um, and and uh, yeah, really appreciate the time. And, and thanks again. It's been really insightful. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it.